Hello there, welcome to Bible Discoveries, the weekend show where, you know, we discuss questions that pop up as we're reading through the Bible this year. And we also aim to discuss some of your questions as well. If this is your first time here, my name is Corey and I'm joined by my husband, Matlock. Hey, Matlock. How you doing? I'm doing well, how about good. you? Good, doing yeah. good, yeah. yeah. Hopefully you guys are all doing well. <laughs> Too. So, Matt, like, what scripture are we taking most of our questions from? Today, we're doing Proverbs 21, mm -hmm. if I recall correctly, to Ecclesiastes yes. 12. You're doing a good yeah. job. Do, that, yeah. those uh, hopefully, the I only had two things to remember, and I did it. <laughs> Your we're name and the, the books of the Bible. <laughs> yeah. No, you got it right. Uh, I checked. Oh, okay, on the good. List. good. good. All right, that's right. about it. So, I'll open up with uh, for following questions. We got a, quite a bit of questions today to deal with. One of them is about two of them, or three of them, are about the Proverbs. All and right. just basic questions about like, what does it mean to train up a child mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And also too, we got two, we're referring to Ecclesiastes, only chapter three this time. So nothing else in Ecclesiastes. Okay. Just some difficult questions wrestling with what the text means in light of other parts of scripture, because we mm -hmm. know Ecclesiastes is fundamentally different in how it's written than the other parts of scripture. And the big question for today is, is philosophy biblical or is it unbiblical? So that's what we're at today. Is it biblical or unbiblical? Right. Right. So I'll open up with the first question. Please do. All right. So this is referring to Proverbs 22, verse 6. Mm -hmm. Scripture says to train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. How can this be true if people raised by the scriptures do depart from it and leave the faith? Yeah. Okay. So um, when... As a parent, I understand the the desire to turn the Proverbs into rules, but they are not. They are not rules. Right. So the Proverbs are general guidelines. They are, they are truths that are generally true, but not always true in specific circumstances. So they are sayings of the wise, right? So, so things that you can rely on generally to be true. So this isn't a command of God. God is not commanding and saying like, when you do this, then this will necessarily happen, especially because we're dealing with human will here. But, but this is common for the Proverbs, right? Uh, lots and lots. They're, they're all situationally relevant. So the Proverbs are giving us, like I said, things that are generally true. So Right. With this proverb specifically, there is a very real temptation. I mean, we have three children um, uh, and there is definitely a, a, a very weighty anxiety that comes with being a parent. Yeah. When you look around at the world and, and you hear all of these things that can happen to your child or, or all of the different so many choices that your child has to make, right? And we want something to guarantee our child's not only their safety in the future, but we would like to know that they stay away from um, destructive ways of thinking and destructive ways of living. But at the end of the day, we cannot control our children and we all know that inherently. And we all know that our parents couldn't control us, the decisions that we made. Um, and so generally speaking, uh, this proverb is true. When you train a child, when you help them to overcome things like their our ultimate selfishness as human beings, right? Learning things like self-control, learning about who God is, learning what right and wrong is according to God's morality, those are very good things to teach your child. But at the end of the day, there will come a time when they are going to choose whether or not they employ the things that they have learned. So this is a very good guideline. And as as parents, like we don't just have to stop here. We know that we actually are commanded by scripture to teach our children. I mean, um, you know, there, there are scriptures that talk about uh, training your children and guiding your children. That we definitely need to do. And there's a huge emphasis on training children in the mm -hmm. Old Testament as well. When you look at Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, a lot of the the uh, rituals, the religious rituals that the that um, Israel went through, were to inspire the next generation, the children, to ask, "Why are we doing this, Mom and Dad?" So that they had a chance to explain and pass on the faith in God. Right. So 
it is a very good thing to do and we are required to do it. But does it mean automatically that all of our children will choose to follow God? No, it does not. So again, the, the Proverbs are gu guidelines that are generally true, but not always true in every specific situation. Right. Well, the, the Proverbs literally mean pro-verb before you act. Yeah. But it's like things that you should think about before you do things. Yes. I will also say to add some point to this, as that when you train up a child in the way he should go so that when he is old, mm -hmm. he won't depart from it, doesn't mean also that they won't depart from it in between those points. They might return right. to it. Um and also, too, to think about this, I think that often at times we can disprioritize, for lack of a better way of putting it, what's actually fundamental and what's not. So we can make things fundamental that aren't fundamental, make things that aren't fundamental as if they're, though they're fundamental, mm -hmm. um, and that can really confuse a child. So we're talking about training a child up. We're talking about training a child up in the true way, in the true or proper order of things. Um, and I think that's really important. So basically, it's like you're saying, you're giving the child the best foot forward possible. Yeah. And I think that it's, I don't want to say that it's necessarily always the case that like, it doesn't matter. Like you shouldn't train your child up. And I know you were saying you weren't you saying that. You definitely have to. Yeah. You have to, right? Because I think that for the most part, this is true. I think for the most part, yes, the child, if you train them appropriately in what's not just being like, oh, like do, follow these set of rules. And therefore, if you follow these rules, Right, without any type of hi sense of hierarchy or what what's prioritizes over the other thing, um, then I think that uh, th there will be some confusion that'll that'll seep in over time. But if you give the, the child a sense of what is actually what matters the most, like God matters the most. Yeah. Like you're not and wholly apart from God. Like you give them fundamental sense of hierarchy, then they'll when they get older they'll see the pattern of how the world works and realize. Yes. So here's right, the thing. Training doesn't mean telling. Yes, exactly. Right? That the best way to learn is to do is to be an apprentice. Yes, right. It's a very, very good way of learning, and and I think all of us know this intrinsically from our lives. You know, when um, so I I come from like on my mom's side, all the women in my family as far back are very good bakers, very very good bakers. And when I was learning how to bake, my mom could have just given me all of the recipes and said, okay, Corey, do it. And I probably could have muddled my way through, but the recipes that I still remember to this day, even though my Nana is, has been gone for a few years now, are the recipes that I made with her that um, you know, a few times a year she would have me over and I would make them with her. I don't need a written recipe for those, even though I have them, because I remember doing them, right? So the best way to learn is to be trained. It's to, to actually have hands-on experience. So we need to live our faith with our children. I'm right. not just telling my son, you know, it's good to have self-control. It's good not to scream at your brother. It's good not to hit. It's and, and it's bad to do those things. I also have to do those things, you know, not be screaming my head off and not being violent and, and treating other people with respect and going to church and showing my love for God and volunteering and treating the people of God as if they're my family and treating other people in the love of God. So all of these things, you know, when you have children, there is a weight of responsibility that comes then to, it's not, you're not just living your faith for you and God anymore. Yes. You're living your faith for you and God and to exemplify that to another human being That's who right. is watching you and they have the greatest, for lack of a better term, BS meter. Yes. Kids know when you're not <laughs> telling the truth and when you're telling the truth and, you know, they will call you well, out on it. Again, it's called before you act, right? Proverbs, before yeah. you act. So it's not yeah. just a matter of, te like you're right, it's, it's not telling, it's teaching. So I think that's really important there. It's not just a matter of, um, you know, making sure that they remember the, you know, the things that you said. It's, what is that old saying? Do as I say, not as I do. It's like, okay, well, that yes. doesn't really apply here. <laughs> there is, there is absolute um, merit to memorizing scripture. Yes. But there is even more merit in living out 
scripture, living right. out the morality and then tying it back. You know, when your kids ask you right. questions about it, well, why are we doing this? I would rather stay at home. Why are we going to volunteer at church? Well, because we want to show God that we love him and because the, that we are all the body of Christ. And then being able to go, look, here's where Paul talks about right. that. Here, here's where the scriptures talk about that. Yes. So, yeah. yeah, there's not, unfortunately, there's not, we can't control someone else's human will. We can only train it. That's right. So I think the proper is is a great guideline. I think so too. That's great. I okay. think that answers it. I want to ask you a question. Sure. Okay. From Proverbs 25, right. verse 2, Hit this me. Bible question says this. Okay. What does Proverbs 25, verse 2 right. mean? And this is what it says. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. What does that mean? Okay. That's interesting. I was reading it here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So for one thing, I think when it is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search things out. And then in verse mm -hmm. three, it says, as the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Okay. Mm -hmm. This sounds like very mysterious, right, in general. So it is the glory of God to conceal things. I think that comes pretty obvious when it comes to the revelation. There are things in life that we don't know. And this includes... Um, not just physical mysteries, but you know, we haven't even explored the depths of the ocean uh, or outer space. There's so much that we haven't explored yet. Not just physical mysteries, but also spiritual mysteries. Like people at this time, Solomon writing this, didn't know uh, who the Messiah was, but he knew that there was a Messiah coming. So it's like there's all these mysteries that are concealed, right, uh, for a certain time. And I know it even says to, to Jeremiah, you know, uh, it was a reason with me and search out the great unsearchable things. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a thing that's limited to kings alone. The prophets also have access to this as well, okay? So that's one thing. So God conceals things, and it's like this enjoyment in discovering these mysteries. And as for the kings, well, the glory of kings to search these things out, they have all the money and resources at their disposal. So a king send, can send out a vessel like, you know, Christopher Columbus from Spain to find the Americas. They can go exploring. So they can do all these different things. Um, and so I think that the kings have the uh, capacity to physically explore things, but then also they can put people in charge to spiritually ex explore things. So the prophets would go to the kings and give them stuff. So there's something to do with kings, with them having them being the epicenter of society in a sense, that all things kind of flow through. And um, Solomon being a prophet king, a philosopher king as well, um, I'm sure that would this would be something that would be, you know, on his heart because what was he doing? He was re studying reptiles and birds and mm. he's studying the, all, the world and architecture and politics and economics. So he was everywhere. Uh, so he was he had the ability, the means, the time uh, to do so. So if you think about us today, uh, how much stuff we have? We have AC. We have. Um, you know, so much stuff compared to like a hundred years ago. I'm just listing AC. <laughs> it's so hot <laughs> the most, outside. The most yeah. important thing. The most right important now, thing right now. Yeah. But no, <laughs> flowing water in our homes and bathrooms, right? And all this stuff. We have so much amenities at our disposal. These are things that kings had at the time of Solomon. Okay. Like no one had the amenities that we have today. And we have more than the amenities. And we're talking about average people who are below you know, the, on the bottom line of life kind of thing, have these amenities. We are living in an age kind of like princes. And so we have the time in a sense, that's what I'm saying. So it's not like back then, people of our means and our, let's say, economic value would not have the time to explore things and to search out the world. It just wasn't built that way. But kings have that time. So it's kind of like in that sense where it's like, oh, today we can go home, sit at home, study, watch things on our phone. And uh, have all the world at our fingertips and, and study, you know, how the world works and the different world religions. That was something that was re reserved for kings. So uh, all the amenities that kind of we have were for kings. Um, so that's what I would say there. So it's like it was something that back then was pretty much restricted to th their time and capacity and what they and the resources that they had. Right. So, um, I I also like how it's limited here. Because uh, in, in verse three, as the heavens are high and the earth is deep, so the hearts of kings are unsearchable. So right. while God has concealed things in creation for mankind to discover and to utilize, right. which was, you know, seen as the job of the king in, in, in the sense of going into the wild and domesticating the wild and bringing it into human um, control and under human dominion to be fostered. 
and tamed, that, that whole idea. Uh, then, lest the king get too proud, um, that understanding that even though that is the case, where they're going out and they're searching and they're trying to uncover and understand the mysteries of God, they still are limited in that they can't even really understand their own heart. Right. And elsewhere in the scripture, it talks about how God is the only one who truly knows the human heart uh, because we are deceived by our own hearts. So I, I appreciate that too. Yes. About the proverb that it, it kind of limits lest the king get too proud. Yeah, that's interesting. I actually didn't interpret it in that way, but that's interesting. I actually was interpreting it more so for the so the heart of kings is unsearchable. I think you're actually more spot on than I was thinking, um, which is that the glory of uh, it's the glory of God to conceal things. In other words, God conceals so many things that it's like it's almost it's impossible to grasp it all. And so, and it's the king's duty to search out these things. And because of that, there's so many things. It's almost unsearchable. Mm -hmm. All those things. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, yeah, but yeah, it, but you're right. The, the hardest, you know, that verse, the hardest to see fully wicked. So. Um, there are things that you just can't grasp, but God can see those things and God can discern those things. Mm -hmm. Only he can do such. Well, that's good. And I think that answers the question. So let so. me ask you the third one. All right. All right. Proverbs 31. Really easy question. Who is King Lemuel? Right. Right. Easy question to answer? I, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Easy Pretty easy question one. on the face. Okay, yeah. so the uh, Proverbs 31 contains the sayings of King Lemuel or the sayings of King Lemuel's mother because King Lemuel, Lemuel says that his mother taught him this utterance. So it says the sayings of King Lemuel or Lemuel, uh, an inspired utterance his mother taught him. A uh, short answer, we have no idea who this individual is. He does not show up anywhere else in the scripture. Um, kings sometimes went by a few different names. There's so many theories about who this is. Um, you know, one of the more popular ones that kind of comes, I, I think is a little bit off in left. I, I think it's interesting is that he is an Ishmaelite king. It's possible. Anything's really possible at, at this point. But um, we don't know. No idea. No idea. We do not okay, know. Okay, well, okay, I think that based on this, so it's the mother writing it to Lemuel, right? Um, and you could even think it could even be a pet name that the mother's giving. It but, could be. It means belonging to God. It does seem like a proper name. A lot of right. names were like this right. in, in the ancient world. A lot of them had. Um, why names. is the word. No. Um, the words escaping me where you incorporate the name of your God into your name. That has a word. Yes. And I'm not, I can't <laughs> like Abraham and today. Sarah? Yeah. Sort uh, of I like mean, that? Isaiah, right. Hezekiah, that, that yeah, oh, okay. in, in, um, in Hebrew, in the original language is the, is a name. It's going to come to me probably at three o'clock in the morning. I'm going to sit up and go, that's what that's called. Right. You, <laughs> it's very popular, not only in Israel and Judah, but also in the surrounding nations, incorporating the name of their God into their proper name is a very popular thing for right. parents to do in naming. Uh, so just the fact that his name means belonging to God or of God does not necessarily mean this is some sort of fake name or hidden name. And I think, I think, I know some people think that this is just Solomon, which I mean, I guess is possible, but then it begs the question, why elsewhere in all the other Proverbs is he known as Solomon and yeah. only here yeah, it's it seems hidden a little strange. secret Solomon, you know? <laughs> or hidden secret Hezekiah, where Hezekiah well, has already been mentioned by a physical right. name. So by an actual What name, I think is interesting, name. if it's written by the mother yeah. to King Lemuel or to, like, to her son, who's going to be king, um, and the name of the, the name mean, if this is Proverbs, it's, it's poetry in a sense. Yeah. Um, so the name meaning could just be like for kings in general, right? The kings that belong to God in general. So it could just be like a, a poetic way of describing. Now that seems weird. I don't know if that would really work, but it could also just be poetic in its, uh, description and in its use. I suppose. I, I don't know. Cause he doesn't come up anywhere else in the Bible. No, no. But he doesn't necessarily have to. No, right? I guess not. I don't I guess think so not. anyway. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> that's the end. That's that question. So hopefully that works. All right. What's next? Okay. Matlock, Ecclesiastes right. 3. We're moving on into Ecclesiastes. Let's do it. All right. 
Okay, so we're going to focus in on Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 to 8, and this is a question from Elaine. Okay. And she says, Ecclesiastes, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose. What season would be would we be reaping at this time in history? And then she has some brackets, wars, weather, immoral behavior, etc. Okay. Um, this is like a big discussion question. It is. Because it's very broad. Uh, when we say we, that's the big kicker because we, we can't think about it in a global sense because um, that will be God's de you know, determination for when the wrath of God comes or the judgment comes. However, having said that, this was written for there to be like, you know, in your life. Let's read. Let's just read it. Uh, verses one to eight. I'll read it right now. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under the heaven. Okay, so if it's winter in Canada, it's somewhere down south. So um, the point here, or it's somewhere, somewhere on the other side of the world. My point here in saying this is that, like, this is not about a global season. This is not like, oh, what's our season? We in general. This is like, this is limited to certain people, certain time periods, or certain places. So there's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up or uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to g gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time to war, a time for peace. Okay. So, in, in her listing is wars, weather, and moral behavior. What are we reaping currently? I think it really depends where you are. I can't give like a full greater context. I think you could, you could say um, in the greater Western ethos, what have, we, what have we reaped so far? Well, you, where, where has, like look at the church. We were primarily a Christian nation. This is primarily subjective, of course. We were primarily a Christian nation. Or Christian nations, a whole bunch of us in the West that uh, had our allegiance pl uh, pledged towards God, and um, most people in the world would, uh, in the West, Western world, would identify themselves as Christian. And now we're in a place we're in a post-Christian world um, where people are not, and they they actually despise Christianity to some extent, um, or they were writing Christianity as a whole, and I don't see that completely as a failure of Christianity as much as a failure to teach Christianity well to our children. And that there's implicit subliminal patterns that we've taught to prioritize, such as putting belief above the truth. Uh, oh, it's Christianity just about belief and faith. It's like, well, faith in truth. You need to grab on the truth. It's not just about belief in and of itself. So um, I would say we're kind of reaping what we've sown in patterns of what we taught theologically uh, in here in the West. So that would be my broad sweeping analysis of what we're reaping. Uh, we taught theology poorly, in a sense, a bad pattern of how to understand God, and therefore we're now people are now doing whatever they believe um, to be true, as opposed to searching out truth first to believe in that. And I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of the Christian faith, but that's what happens when people are raised with that way of looking at the faith. Uh, belief is prioritized, the inner man's prioritized over the, uh, you know, extrinsic truth that's beyond you. Um, so, hey, that's my quick thought of what yeah. we're reaping, but that's one, I, that's one thought. There's a bunch, I think there's a bunch of different avenues and angles to this question. It's a pretty big, it could even have been the big question, actually. It's a big question, and it's interesting to think about, but, yeah. and here's my caveat. Um, I don't like thinking of this as just something that's happening to us. Right. Like when, when I look at this question, it's kind of, it, it feels as though this is just something that is going to happen regardless of what we do. This is a season that we're reaping in. And I know that God has times and purposes and his will is intermingling with human will. And he is working yeah. out his plan and his purpose for humanity. Okay. There is redemptive history. Jesus Christ is coming again. 
it, there, there's, there's a flow to history that's interesting and we're not gonna be able to see it fully until the end and we're able to step back, okay? I, I understand that. But there's only so much value, I think, in looking broad scale because yeah. we are so limited yes. in not only our human experience, but even the history that we have is limited. Our point of view is limited where God's is enormous, right? So, <clears throat> um, and this idea, I think, and um, which really interestingly bogged down the mind and the heart of the author of Ecclesiastes, he, he became rather desperate and despairing over this idea, the, the weight of everything being meaningless. <clears throat> um, life is not just happening to us in a way that we can't make a difference. Uh, Christ gave us a commission. He gave us a role. He gave us a job here right now. So when you look at it in terms of redemptive history, we are living in the time period of the new covenant of Christ. Okay, He has given us a, a, a commissioning that we read about in Matthew 28 and in, in, and in the other Gospels as well, where we are to go out into the world and make disciples of people. We are supposed to be spreading the gospel of Christ and, and working to that end. And it, it, made me, it made me think of John 4. And I think probably because Elaine used the term reaping and Christ uses the term reaping right. in John 4, that's probably what yeah, cued yeah. me here. But it's when Jesus was on the road and he stopped in a Samaritan city. And this is when he spoke to <clears throat> a Samaritan woman, someone who culturally he should not have had the time of day for. He should have ignored her at best. Okay. Uh, culturally speaking, and yet he didn't. He showed an interest in her and he began to speak to her. And when his disciples joined up with him again, uh, it says this, this is John 4, 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Uh, and then I'm going to, I'm going to skip down. Okay. Cause she goes back into the town and his disciples, you know, they're like, okay, rabbi, you need to eat something you haven't eaten in a long time. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, Jesus says this in verse 34, my food said, Jesus is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Uh, we need to be paying attention. There, sure, there is a grand scheme afoot with human history and redemptive history, but what is it that we are called to do individually? Are we taking time to invest in people's lives and to have conversation, even small conversations uh, with the people around us, uh, whether they are believers or unbelievers, um, are we taking those opportunities? Because, um, I mean, you can take the, imagery of reaping and sowing is mm. all throughout the scripture and it's applied in several different areas, yes. in several different ways. I mean, even, even farming imagery, when you go to Galatians five and growing the fruit of the spirit, right? Yeah. The spirit, just having a relationship with God an active relationship with God makes you physically grow and, and develop these qualities that are amazing. Yes. Right. So that's what I would add into the conversation yeah. as well. So don't get too bogged down by the overarching scheme of history that we are limited in, um, so much so that you don't focus on what God has us, the purposes that God right. has for us right now. Because yeah. there are differences that God can make and does make and is making through his people, right. through the Church of Christ. What's important too is when he lists out Solomon, a time to be born, a time to die, he's listing all these different things, a time to plant, a time to uproot, right? Yeah. Time to break down, time to build up, and he keeps going. He's not saying that these things are just always happening to you, like right. you were saying. He's like, no, it's time for you to go out and do these things. Mm -hmm. The time has come for you to, like, to heal, or maybe you have to take care of business. Um, but it's like, he's basically just saying like, the opposite happens. It's like sometimes like you don't want to have to, you know, in this case, a time to kill. You don't want to have to um, 
and this is capital punishment where someone does something wrong versus a time to heal. Sometimes things come where it's like, okay, well, capital punishment has to happen. But other times, like, okay, well, the healing has to happen. These are opposites yeah. in a sense. So it's like opposites happen. And so it's like when you're in this case, it's like you can't use these opposites as a basis for meaning or for morality or for just seeing what's going to happen in your life. Because these opposites will happen in your life and you're going to have to execute them. You're going to have to execute that sounds worse. You're going to have to move, uh, carry out these orders or the, uh, and embrace this time in your life. There's a time to tear, there's a time to sow, time to keep silence, time to speak. In other words, um, it's not really about just passively waiting around. It's about knowing and discerning when to apply that. Uh, so long story short, it's not like you're right. It's not just about reaping what someone else has sown for us. Because mm -hmm. that is, it's a, it was like a grand scale. The question comes across like a grand scope. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah, right. Sure. But there is things that what can we do? Okay, well, let's get our theology right. It's time to have good theology, and it's, let's ha let's have a relationship with God right. That's and exactly our priorities right. Priorities correct in our lives, and let's be living it out. And let's take you know. That's right. No, those are yeah. always time for that. But like, always. But time. was there a time when it wasn't that? It looks like there was. So let's let's just let's get back and get our, our lives back in order, and actually do the right thing. That's it. Agreed. So, but. Without judgment, because you know, the, our, our forefathers went through things that we don't, that we are not going through. So, it is one of those things where we know that there's faults that happened, but they did their best to help us, and so we have to appreciate. Yeah, we 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 have all inherited a culture. We have all inherited yes, um, a nation. No matter where we we are, um, that doesn't mean we just have to live with it like that. Yeah, he's yeah. right. We, we the, the God inherited us you know right. when we our 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 sin and and all of our warts and and like spiritual warts i'm talking about like awful things christ redeems us and right. he covers us with his righteousness and and so there is hope in the darkness whenever god is there whenever the holy spirit is there whenever the 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 saving work of christ is there there is hope right. and that is a very good thing it is a good have, thing uh, you know don't become so bogged down by all the brutal things going on in our culture that we lose our hope, right? Uh, we don't have to do that. That's right. I agree. All Keep right. our eyes on Christ and let's, on God. Let's move on. I'm going to read the next one. This is still Ecclesiastes 3. Okay. Okay. And it's a viewer question. Hello, how can Ecclesiastes 3.11 say eternity is in our hearts, and yet Ecclesiastes 3.19, verse 19 to 20, Say we die like animals. How can both be true? Don't we live forever? It also says, nobody knows for sure that this human spirit rises to heaven or the animal spirit sinks into the earth. But we do know, don't we? Thanks. Right. Okay, so a few things here, right? There's there's a few things going on. So Ecclesiastes 3.11, let's do 9 to 11. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That And, and he goes on and on and on. So this is, a, this is a moment of contemplation where the author is like, oh, this is really depressing. Oh, but God does, does do this good thing. But oh, this is really depressing. And he's kind of going back and forth and back and forth, right? So um, he's contemplating the, the futility of human of, of human life where we're just constantly trying to get sustenance for ourselves, right? So that we can live. But he's like, what's the point? We're going to die anyway. But I guess God has placed eternity in our hearts. So he's, he's going back. Yes. He's really struggling with this idea. Uh, and then... Uh, Oh, I lost the I lost the question here. And then you go on to 19 to 20. Let's look at that. Okay, okay, okay. I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. So there's, there's this futility concept again. Like, yes. why? Why is this happening? <laughs> um, all have the same breath, right? That life, that animation in them. Humans have no advantage over animals. And of course, he's talking about the fact that we all die, right? right. Uh, 
everything is meaningless. He's losing it. He's having a hard time. <laughs> uh, verse 20, all go to the same place. All come from dust and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. Uh, so again, he's struggling here. This is the, this is this is the midst of his flow of consciousness, his thoughts going back and forth with we're smarter than the animals, but we die like the animals. So what's the point? And who really knows where spirits go? I do not experientially. The author of Ecclesiastes is all about experiential knowledge. Remember when he's like, I tried to be foolish and realized that that was <laughs> that was dumb, and that I tried to be super wise and I realized that didn't bring me any joy either just more pain he's all about experiential knowledge here so he gets to the death and he's like well who really knows where the spirit goes like we don't really know we have to trust god we don't really know do we uh but i wanted to point out to you i wrote down a note for myself when we get to ecclesiastes 12 he's kind of brought himself back around he goes to verse uh 12 verse 7 where is that okay yeah um and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who, who gave it. So he does believe that the human spirit returns to God. So two things I would say. One, we're dealing with this particular author's stream of con consciousness, his thoughts and his struggle wrestling with the seeming futility of human life and then what he believes about God making the spirit of mankind eternal and, and the spirit returning to God. He's really struggling with this. Uh, so that's the first thing that I would say is that just picking and choosing verses from here, of course, they're going to seem contradictory because that's literally what he's struggling with. He's struggling with, yeah. the, with, with the seemingly contradictory right. nature of human life. But another thing that I would say, I think it's interesting. Uh, we do know, don't we? We know a whole lot more now than King Solomon knew when he wrote Ecclesiastes. Or, right. or, or if, you know, we are living on this side of the cross of Christ where there is very clear teaching about eternal life and about eternity and about heaven and hell and, and all of that. But in the time of Solomon, he didn't even have the major prophets to that, that really helped flesh this out flesh right. out this concept for us right right except so, with the exception of samuel rising from the grave that sure but but th that would be throw you off a bit too I'll throw you off a bit because he also says that the spirit ascends to heaven so it ascends to god so that would throw, throw him off and he does believe this we yes. see that he does believe yes, this, he does. but he's struggling because again he we really see throughout the yes. book that he prioritizes experiential knowledge. Yes. And so he's like, who really knows? I well, can't experience I, I that. I think, right. So this comes down to these is a understanding what is the genre of the book. So, sure. So yeah. the, the Psalms are poetry, right? Ecclesiastes is a prose discourse, which essentially means you're writing things normally. Yeah. You're just writing things normally. So it's like you're saying a stream of consciousness. You're thinking about things as you write. Yeah. And you're expressing yourself like a diary almost in this sense. So he's just writing things down in, in, in a normal way. It's not written poetically. Here's and, my struggle with the meaning of life. Could also be the title of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> yes, it could be. So <laughs> anyways, so long story short, I think that, yeah, you pretty much nailed it on the head. I don't think these are in conflict. It's not like just because the Holy, and I think the issue might come in with the, this idea of the Holy Spirit. How okay. could the Holy Spirit inspire him to say this, but then also inspire someone else to say this later? You see what I'm saying? I think that's might be what the, where the, the complication might be coming th from. Um, and to that, I would say, well, the Holy Spirit didn't reveal a lot of things, like yeah. you were saying, well, to the people before Christ revealed it. Well, and, 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 and in, okay, so the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Scripture doesn't mean that everything that we read in Scripture is going to be true in the sense of representing God's truth, okay? So when you take a look, for example, at some of the speeches of Job's friends, they say a lot of wrong things about God. So if you were just to open the book to Job and just read, a few, pluck a few verses out of Job and say, well, this is going to inform now my understanding of who God is, that would be a, a huge problem. Because as you continue reading through the book of Job, you get to the end of Job where God says, your friends have misrepresented me. And now you have to offer a sin sacrifice for them so that they can be forgiven of their sins. Right and their presumptuous speech against me, right? 
So there are things that the, just because the, the, the Holy Spirit has inspired something and has allowed something to be, to be contained in the scripture doesn't mean that it is necessarily representative of do, who God it doesn't is. Mean it is. We're allowed to struggle and there's yes, struggle that we but see through this. It doesn't mean that each verse is a discrete package of truth. Yes. Thank yes. you. That's so, what yeah, I'm trying to yeah, say. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you and you can't think in those terms because everything has a greater context yes. and meaning. And it's moving towards a greater narrative and a greater theme yes. that it's trying to drive forward. So it's like you have to and that's how you read anything actually. You yes. have to look in those terms. You can't just read imagine you read like Tom Sawyer and you're like every single line was like some sort of like truth bomb that mm -hmm. you had to say. And it's like, it wasn't feeding into a greater, you just mm -hmm. can't read things like that. That's not how anything works. Yeah, so I think context definitely matters. And I think this is where sometimes verses get people because they see verses and are like, oh, it's, it's supposed packaged. to be, it's an instruction manual. I read this verse. This verse is true. Yeah. And it's just a misunderstanding about just about how to apply the text. All right. So I think that's good. I think so too. I okay, think that's so it. once we went to the big question, okay, and sure. wrap this guy up. Let's do it. Wrap this show Let's up. Let's do okay. it. Big question, Matlock. Is philosophy unbiblical? Or is it biblical? That's which the big is question. It? Which <laughs> is it? Because right. Ecclesiastes can be quite All depressing. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it, it is like a pessimistic, philosophical, like yeah. a sense account of life. Like life is meaningless, right? At the very end of his of his life, I think this is an older Solomon. I, I, that's what I assume Probably. when I read this. At he, the very end of everything that, that yeah, he's done through all these things, and he's realized. Well, everything I've done is pretty much useless. I've tried to obtain human wisdom in the wrong way. I've also there's... become a terrible idolater and set Israel on a path that will ultimately destroy her. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's that. There's that too. But, <laughs> oh, um, Solomon. Oh, Yeah. So man, I think dude. that uh, the the thing here, there's a lot of people who are un uneasy about what, what, about what philosophy is and what philosophy means. So let's just break it down to its bare bone context. What is philosophy, first of all? Philosophy is the love of wisdom. That's what it means in the Greek. Having said that, in contemporary sense, it's actually much more than that because we know that philosophy was, um, you know, Peter, uh, Paul talks about this, who is the wise man of this age. Philosophy was seen as a, a way of describing philosophers of the Greek sort, right? The Ionic, the different kinds of philosophers of the time period. There's the Epicurean, Stoic that were around that were not, you know, godly men. They were just people thinking things through. Uh, you know, on their own naturalistic terms, let's say. Um, naturalistic, but you know what I'm saying. The gist is there. Um, when you think about that in, in its own terms, it's like, okay, you could be like, philosophy back then was comprised of those, but what is philosophy today? Well, there's a huge era of Christian philosophers and Christian philosophy, which is basically in a nutshell, philosophy is thinking things through thoroughly. Um, and that thoroughly part, is what makes like a philosopher from like an amateur philosopher. Um, how thorough you are determines whether or not you're going to be doing this for a living. Okay, so for a lot, so you just think things through thoroughly, and that is the premise of contemporary philosophy. So you have like Thomas of Aquinas, right? Uh, Augustine. You have these great philosophers, Scotus, throughout history, Anselm, uh, who have really thought about what it means to be. Christian in like in in its fullest sense and using reason to do that. Um, that doesn't mean philosophy is the basis of salvation. I think that's what's important here, but it means that philosophy can be useful. So the question is: Is philosophy unbiblical? Uh, is wisdom unbiblical? Is the question. And I think that because uh, it's about love and wisdom. I, yeah. I believe that there's earthly wisdom, yeah, and there's godly wisdom. That's what James talks about. So is philosophy is the question: Is philosophy godly wisdom or is philosophy Earthly wisdom. It can be either. I, go ahead. I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Right. I, I was just gonna say it can be either. We can we can elevate our own we can okay. The danger with philosophy, even Christian philosophy, is that we intellectualize the faith so much that we begin to lean on our understanding of theology or our understanding of the Bible right. or our understanding of how the world works, and even begin to to um look to other men and women who are thinking deeply about these issues to build our faith on. And that will always fail and fall. And that is a bad idea. Right. That is a bad, bad idea. It is not a bad thing. It is a good thing to think deeply about our faith and to critically think about our faith. It is a bad thing to base our faith off of, off of our, our own rationale. 
yes, our own rationale of, of God. And, and we see, that, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul is justifying his ministry to the Corinthians, and he uh, he's really explaining it. And, um, and he talks about how he purposely approached them in a very humble manner because he didn't want them to idolize him. He didn't want their faith to be based off of his uh, persuasive arguments, but he came to them only preaching Christ and Christ crucified. So that's a bit of the context of First Corinthians 2. Um, verse 6 says this, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Uh, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Um, and then I'm going to skip. To, oh, maybe I won't. Okay, I'll just keep reading. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments, for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we had the mind of Christ. Right. So very important to approach wisdom from, from a place of being redeemed by God. No, you need to. Yes. I, I don't think you can you can remove, like I was saying, there's two types of wisdoms happening here. There's the earthly human wisdom that Paul's talking against. Yep. And then there's godly wisdom, which is what James promotes. Um, I'm going to get to James. Sure. I can recall where it is. Anyways, but in this, um, in this distinction, this is what's important because in its bare bones form, there's no issue with thinking things through, but you can't predicate, and I don't think people should do this, though there could be some who do, predicate your salvation on your own understanding of, let's say, how God works in reality. Mm -hmm. And I, I, there's a little bit of a blend there with theology and in philosophy, there is a blend. For sure. Right? But at the same time, yeah, you shouldn't predicate your salvation upon that. I think that's foolish. Having said that, is it unbiblical to be, uh, to apply philosophy at all? Why can't I find James in here? Uh, yeah. And another thing that I would say just as you're, as you're doing that yeah. is that um, there is, there can also be a tendency to... Um, to prioritize philosophy and theology over the study of the scripture. And that is a mistake because when you, you can't, you can't, you should not, I don't think you can, I don't think it's possible, I don't think it's valid to divorce your understanding of God from the scripture or your understanding of, um, of the Christian life and the purpose of the world without the scripture. Because this is a measure that God has given us by which we evaluate things and we evaluate ideas. So when we begin to create whole systems of thought that then yes. will interpret the scripture, you run into all sorts of problems, right? right? And then we start to elevate the framework um, that we have created over the scripture itself and over the spirit of God itself, which is, it, it can be a very dangerous thing. It can and be it a can lead block. to idolatry of our own selves and idolatry of teachers, um, which incidentally we also see right. in the scripture. And so here it says, in the new church, and in I know New Testament church. Uh, Timothy, when it says, so all scriptures God breathed, yep. right before that, Paul is saying to Timothy, um, uh, the sacred scriptures, which are profitable to make you wise through to for salvation yeah. through faith. Yeah. So this idea that wisdom, wisdom's not a bad thing. So when 
Paul's talking against who's the wise man of this age. He's yeah. not talking against wisdom per se. He's talking about this type of wisdom that James is talking about. So let me mm -hmm. read this. This is James uh, verse 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works and meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. That is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, basically just, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Long story short, if you notice here what James is talking about, what is wisdom, open to reason is one of them, but it's also peaceable, gentleness, full of mercy, impartial justice, mm -hmm. being sincere, right? And the opposite is jealousy and selfish ambition, yeah. basically, is, is the antithesis of, of uh, godly wisdom. So you think about selfishness being at the center of 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 anti wisdom, essentially, the, yeah. it, it looks like wisdom, but it's not wisdom. Yeah, it's building, a, it's a counterfeit. building a worldview without God, but that's still. And I think a, a lot of philosophy philosophies are guilty of this, right? Right, where you're trying to build an understanding of the world without God in it, right? And that's foolish. And and at the same time, yes, exactly. So where God has to be there. So at the same time, that we can't forget in Acts 17. Paul quotes two philosophers to the Stoics and Epicurean philosophers there at the Areopagus. Um, so basically, like, in him we move and have our being. And yeah, he, also he was familiar with their literature and used it to promote exactly. the gospel. But what's interesting about that. For them. Exactly. Is that he's like, we are indeed their offspring was the other poem sure. that he highlighted. Um, he's using common philosophical language that's, that's plain to them that they would, that's well known to the Greeks there. Um, in order to draw them into the gospel. Yeah, he's speaking their language. Exactly. In order to witness to them. Right, but what's important about them. that is that he's saying that there's an increment, little, uh, an element of truth in these things. Sure. He's like, look, there's a little element of truth in these philosophies. Yep. Obviously, the greater context can't all be true. Yep. But he's saying, look, they understood here that we're the offspring of God. Let's use that so they can hear that even your philosophers can see this. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the whole point of it was to say, hey, it was to draw people in. With that, is philosophy unbiblical? I'm going to say, okay, well, it really depends on the philosophy you're doing. Yeah, it totally right? can be. And then, but also, too, it boils down to uh, how do you use it? Like apologetics, you would say today, is the common framework in which philosophy is used the most. Sure. And yep. uh, it, can it be a bad thing? I can't, I think anything can be a bad thing. I think you can overboil yeah, philosophy. Or... Absolutely. And I think the same thing goes with theology. Upon. Systematic theology upon. is what you're talking about. Sometimes you, people get too hunt. A hamstrung on systematic theology mm -hmm. to the point where it navigates how they read everything and then they completely miss things that they're reading in scripture mm -hmm. and can't see it because their systematic theology their framework and their filter has told them it can't mean what it plainly says yep um and that's an unfortunate thing so uh, i don't think that philosophy is a basis for the christian life uh, so is it unbiblical i'm going to say it's kind of a weird question um no uh, it doesn't have to be because christian philosophy can be a good thing um, because the point of philosophy is to think things through, so that includes deconstructing your own frameworks if they're wrong. Right. So I don't think it's a bad thing, but I don't think it's unbiblical. Is philosophy, love of wisdom, human wisdom, square brackets between that, I think that's, un yeah, that's anti, that's unbiblical. Fair enough. Yeah. And that's, that's my two cents on that. <laughs> I don't know. Fair enough. Okay. I would like right. to hear, I would like to hear what you think about all of these questions. So if you'd like to, please pop your comments and your questions down below. And until next time, happy reading and happy studying. Thank you so much for watching. We want to keep producing high quality biblical content, but we can't do it without your support. If you feel called to support us, please click the link in the description under donate. Your support really means a lot to us.